Hi, I'm Charlotte Curtis, Head of Adult Services with the Livingston Parish Library, and I'm here today talking with Dr. Gina Little of Southeastern University's College of Chemistry and Physics. Everybody always thinks about people that come from a liberal arts background being interested in reading, but sometimes you just don't think about how much reading it takes to be a good scientist. So I know that Dr. Little is a very popular scientist as well as instructor at Southeastern, and I called and asked her if she'd come in and talk to us today about some of the big influences readings had on her professional career. So Dr. Little, thank you so much for coming in. And as you know, you're here today because one of your former students recommended you as being one of her very favorite instructors. So, yes, excellent. Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> so, so thanks so much for coming in and talking to us. Absolutely. So I know while we were waiting to get set up, you said that you have a daughter that's in her 20s. Yes. And that she likes to read now, but she didn't always like to read. Oh, yes. So she liked to read when she was a little kid. And then once we got to about second grade, where it starts moving to the chapters, uh, it was too long. And she just squidded. And, and then there was assignments. Um, and then eventually she started getting involved a little bit in um, like short reading, newspapers, magazines. And then, of course, when the Internet really sort of boomed, you know, there's always a blog or... Uh, different places that then she uh, eventually started getting into some of the like paranormal fantasy she liked some of those wow. books and then she found fan fiction which was a perfect alliteration of having a place to discuss about it and talk about it and read other examples about it and um, obsess about it so she's uh, definitely so she's so now she's uh, enjoys reading and she uh, enjoys the reading the book with the audiobook playing alongside it oh. so she'll have the book in one and She's definitely one of the ones, though, who likes paper books. She I love paper does books. not like the digital books. And she's like, oh, I just like knowing where I am in the book and where I have. And I, I like that for textbooks and, and reference books where you need to go back and forth. But if it's going to be a linear read, I'm, I really love the convenience of the, the digital and the idea that when you finish one book, you can grab another really quick. <laughs> you can, and I like being able to listen to a book while I'm driving. Yes. So I've got a, a long commute, and a book makes it go a lot faster. That is true. So how about yourself? Were you always a, a reader? From Yes. So I learned to read. I, I was reading before I entered school. and uh, you Really? Know, yeah. So, so your it parents. picked it up as a yes. Well, remember, when I went to school, we didn't have pre-K. Right. It was still new to have kindergarten. Yes. <laughs> so prior to kindergarten, so I was I had moved rent into kindergarten having read small books. I remember uh, Ezra Keats, Snowy Day. Um, you know a lot of my favorite you know picture books, and then moving on to that, of course. Um, so I oh you know that was always a big trip for our family was to go to the library, and you know we'd go to our short our our, our local library. I lived in a village um, about the same size as Albany. And again, just like Albany is right near a big city like Hammond, which is, so Scotia was right near Schenectady. So sometimes we would go to our local branch and sometimes on a big day we'd go to the big branch, which just seemed like a museum to me. And having, you know, places to sit and read and craft activities and all the things that, you know, libraries provided. It was just a, that was a, a real um, active presence in our lives. So did any of the books that you read push you into your current field? Um, I was always interested in math and science and sort of went along. But I do think that reading is certainly a, a powerful force. You know, reading forces you to, to, to learn and, and read and piece things together and, you know, make projections about what's going to happen in the story. And those are definitely uh -huh. skill sets that you use as a scientist to think about, well, what would happen if and, and what about this and um, different viewpoints and all the different... Um, so... I, I will say though, I definitely am more of a fiction reader. Really? Uh, yes. That surprises me. Yes. So I, I do like I do like nonfiction too, but I you know I do a lot of sh reading of periodicals and and websites, and so I get that there. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. um, but the uh, but I love the um, the escape of going into a, a, a novel. You know, and, and really delving into it and seeing things from new perspectives and new ideas. Um, so, uh, 
when I was in sixth grade, uh, I had just moved to a new school, mm. and that's always a transition. Even though it was only across town, it wasn't very far away, but um, it would be kind of like moving from Albany to Springfield. But it was enough of a change, a new school, everything was different, and um, that year our school library, had, the librarian had, Miss Grace Riccobono, had just started a new program having a book club for the sixth graders. And uh, so that was immense. That was not reading for um, just for fun's sake, but actually having a place to discuss a specific book. And I got very close with her, and she would give me um, specific recommendations. And she started, you know, she started to know who I was and what I liked. And that was probably the first time that I started having a curated library experience, which ah. is, you know, fantastic. Librarians are fantastic for that, where they could say, "I love this book. Where can I find more?" Um, you know, some of the uh, programs out there do that, but they usually do it by finding other books by the same author. A librarian can say, ah, tell me what you liked about this book, and I know just the book in a way that Amazon will never be able to do. No, you won't. Know? And so, um, so she introduced me to Zilpha Keatley Snyder, and um, I just loved the sort of, they, she, all of her books are sort of um, a lot of girls, but uh, kids with, you know, having some kind of thing going on in their life, but and sort of a finding a new world. Um, so the one that so I this was at from middle school. You yeah, so sixth grade. Kids. Yes, exactly. Oh, wow. and so I started reading those, um, and I just poured through all of her books. The Velvet Room was a particular one. The Secret Room was kind of had the secret garden feel to it. Right. Um, and just you know, very powerful uh, books. In fact, I reread it, and it was one of those. It almost it lost the charm. You know, when you reread it. 40 years later, it doesn't quite have, I was like, this was like the perfect book. It was still a good book, but not the same magicism that I had had before. But you were a different person. Of course, yes. So, um, and so the, the, these became this new world of finding these uh, really fantastic stories. I read The Hobbit that year. And I like The Hobbit, oh. but uh, uh, I like, I, I particularly like fictions where they escape into a world that could exist with ours. Mm. I think uh, later on I read um, the next big one would be The, the Crying of Lot 49 by yes. Thomas Pynchon. Right. Again, this sort of like the idea that this world could coexist, this magical, crazy world could coexist in our world. And it was almost like, but what if it really is true? You know? Oh. And, and I'm sure all the people who've read that book look at uh, every time you see a garbage can with waste, think about, hmm, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> and then this. Sula. Sula. So this one was, I think I read probably about senior year of high school, maybe freshman year of college, and um, super powerful. It just, um, the idea of being able to view something from someone else's viewpoint. She was such a strong female character, and you know, there's a few scenes without getting spoilers that where her convictions of being an advocate for herself were so strong that her actions were just mind-blowing to me. I just felt like this was an example of somebody who was going to stand up for what they believed in and, and, and be strong and confident. Um, and uh, it was just, it, it, it made me view things from a new perspective. I think that's what books are great for doing. And I know when you were getting into the sciences, that was probably something that helped you because there probably weren't a lot of other women in your field. Yes. There? Well, it's I would say that, you know, in chemistry, so in things like computer science and math, it was particularly um, um, a void of people. By the time I was growing up in the 80s, there were women in science, but there was definitely um, not an equal footing. Mm -hmm. And an idea of being there, but maybe not being in the same numbers, and maybe um, having a, a, a different level of, d different expectations. I think that uh, this one I read in college, and this one, Carl Sagan's Contact, ah. was beautiful for that. Um, for those of you who don't know it, it's sort of this uh, almost a philosophical approach to thinking about um, out, uh, alien life and, and extraterrestrial worlds, but also thinking about, it's, almost, it's a very theological kind of book. There's a lot of philosophy in it. But the story is definitely uh, a character um, no, I can't remember her name, the character's name. But the, the main character is a female astronomer, so again, in a, a male-dominated world, really trying to carve her mark and finding, you know, uh, people taking credit for her work 
and not giving her due opportunities and really struggling with that. And um, Carl Sagan did a fantastic job, really. And that was right when I was thinking about applying to graduate schools. And this was definitely um, something that is was very relevant to that world and, and sort of seeing it and being prepared and knowledgeable about, you know, this, uh, how to retain your, your true self. And it definitely um, embarked upon um, a lot of themes of that and finding sponsors and, and mentors who would really help me, you know, the idea is that can, can you not give up your identity as a woman but still be a scientist and be treated in, 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 on an equal basis. And that's a, a very hard thing, even still today, for women in science to navigate. And I would imagine particularly where you attended graduate school. Yes, although actually, uh, so I was at Yale, and uh, Yale was a particularly, um, it, there was such um, an intellectual community. Uh, you know, certainly, and actually at Yale, I met many wonderful mentors um, who was just the opposite. It was, it, it was invigorating to see. Um, uh, Dr. Joan Stites was a uh, bio, she would probably be called bio molecular uh, chem, um, biologist at this point. Um, and uh, she would, she was just brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I, I would come in there and I'd struggle every day to keep up and I'd go home and I was always lost in that class because she was just it, it would like make so much sense in her presence and I would leave and be confused say, I don't know what this is um, but she also every day equal to figuring out what we were going to do was how was her hair she had this beautiful hair always updone and beautiful French braids and up sweeps and you know I love that that was part of her too mm -hmm. you know that this was this she was very feminine but also completely her own I mean it was she carved her own mark and I, I felt that that was really an important part of her. Um, and she was a full professor. We had a new young, uh, Lana Shepherds was at that point, uh, a young person coming in, tenure track in our department and watching her rise meteorically was fantastic. And sort of, so actually, I'd say Yale was a particularly prolific place for me Good. to see. Wonderful, Meg Urie is a, a physicist there. Women in science who really took their role seriously and really embrace the idea of making sure that they, um, you know, made made an equal footing and the idea that they could be who they are, you know, still have equal footing and representation, but not have to change themselves and be one of the men. Mm -hmm. And I think that prior to that, probably in the '60s and '70s, that was sort of the, um, and probably earlier, is that you 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 know the women's the room the was uh, I think in the '70s, but the idea is that you you needed right, you know, to. You could be successful, but you had to be one of them. Right. And well, how do you retain your own persona in that world? And uh, it's still a challenge today, but it's become much better. On my reading list this summer is, uh, I think Hope Jaron is the author, but the lab girl is a, um, she's a horticulturist. But again, talking about her experience as being a woman in the field of biology. And I've heard great things about it. I'm looking forward to reading that this oh, summer. It sounds great. Yeah. Well, be sure and log that when you enter the summer reading program. So. Yes, actually, I have not done that yet. I've participated yearly, but so is uh, this next, is digital program. We start uh, June first, and so by the time this airs, the program will have been running for several weeks. So I just want to remind all of you that are watching right now, if you haven't yet registered for summer reading, it's not too late. And to complete the adult portion. You just need to read three books or read one book and do two crafts, any combination, but basically three library events and then you get a lovely completion prize. So, so see, you're a third of the way there when you read the book. I will. So, and I see this, this was the one that, to me that was the big surprise when I saw this. <laughs> so, so in, when I was in high school, we were lucky to have enough time in the day. I think as curricular has changed, curricula has changed, this has becomes difficult. But uh, every other Wednesday during your English class, you, it was free reading time. Yes. And you would read freely whatever you want. And they encouraged it to not be a homework assignment, mm -hmm. but to be truly a free reading. And of course, the teachers often had uh, big bookshelves, and um, this one was on the bookshelf, and so I started it. it. Took me four years to finish reading. Oh yeah. I started it and dropped it, and started it and dropped it, and I, you know I'd get a certain point, and I just couldn't get into it. And then I think it was a winter break in college. I picked it up again, 
and started reading it and I was just fascinated by it. I think that the, the storylines I love in it are not Anna Karenina's storyline, but uh, Kitty and Levin's storyline. Mm -hmm. And Levin's very philosophical, um, you know, spending a lot of time thinking about what his job was and what was the role and learning so much about the um, Russian, you know, kind of caste, the, the, the moving from the a class right. society to a more, um, a more democratic version of that. And uh, I don't know the historical words, but just this great revelation. And um, I just like was fascinated by it. So, but it took me four years to, to finish. So I, I, it's, a, it's a bid for persistence. So it's okay. Persistence yes. is, is, you know, and I think that when I did read it, I was open to the ideas. I think if I had completed it in high school, none of those things that I found most endearing would have, I wasn't ready for those. No, when you said you started it in high school, I thought, oh, wow. I'm... Yeah, well, yeah. I didn't finish it in high school. Okay, well, it's. And I've started War and Peace. In high but school? But I have not finished it. No, no. Yeah. As an adult. Well. Because I said, well, I like this one so much. Let me try War and Peace. I'm still working on it. It'll still be there. <laughs> it may take a long, long time to finish that one. But I like what you said. Uh, it seems like at different points in our life, different things are appealing. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah. Yes. In fact, now I find that I read more young adult fiction, um, partly because it's shorter and a faster read and I don't have as much long periods of time. I can tend to read them in a couple of days when I have a time to really spend a lot of time reading. Um, and they tend to be more consistently well-written. Uh, I was just gonna say, uh, there are fantastic adult-written books with lovely um, lyrical words and, and uh, phrasings, and, uh, and I love them, but they tend to be hit or miss to find, yes. whereas I tend to get that more consistently. And I love, um, there's so many great authors with uh, empowering women heroines. Uh, the, the, I tend to find myself well, reading those. We can, <laughs> because we can identify with the protagonists. Especially when they're kind of thrown into a situation and they really have to sort of find the strength within and get themselves out of there, you know, not rescued by a prince. No, but, but like this is what everybody's had to do the last few months because none of us was given a game plan when COVID came along. Absolutely. And we've all managed to pull together and make things work. Absolutely, yes. And I, and I find that um, there's, there's just, you've seen it, right? And of course, all these uh, pandemic things like that we've never experienced before go out there in the literature. I mean, how many different series do we find? And everybody says, how did this get printed on time? You're like, it's 20 years old. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, you know, a thought exercise that um, authors have done and sort yes. of thought about what if, and of course we have this huge rich uh, area of dystopian novels where we really embark on all these crazy things that could happen and uh, really thinking about how does that affect society and, and what happens and what are the important things and how do you reconstruct society, it's things that will certainly be, you know, a you challenge spoke. for us. <laughs> I'm so glad that we have technology, though, because I don't know what we would have done if we had not had Facebook and Zoom and team meetings and all the other things. It's just made it so much easier to stay And connected. cell phones to stay, you know, with notifications, all, so much of the, yes. I think that that has made this definitely um, doable, you know. It's not pleasant to be socially distant, but to be able to call somebody and FaceTime them and, and see them face to face and, and still have that connection, that's been very important. And I had a FaceTime doctor's appointment this morning because you know it, I needed to, to see him, he needed to see me, and we both didn't need to be in the same room because we're both in a category that you know we have to take extra precautions. So Absolutely. it worked perfectly. So yes. Yay, technology. <laughs> so, and if you need help with technology, of course, tune in to our Technology Tuesdays because every week at 1 o'clock we address another issue to help you navigate uh, some of the technological issues that we're coming up with. So, that's fantastic. Yes, we're excited. It's great, but it can be very daunting. If Absolutely. You, if you've never used your cell phone for anything except to make a phone call, and then suddenly we go, well, you can read books on this, and you can watch movies. Well, you need, I need somebody to show me how to do it. So. Yes, and that's, libraries have always filled that void. You know, whatever is up and coming and new, 
the new things, you know, libraries have been great resources as being a place that's not expensive, you know, free services, um, really, you know, helping empower the public. It's very right. lucky. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking with us about some of your favorite books. And it, it was just a delight to get to talk with you. Y'all have a treat coming because Dr. Little is also going to be filming a program with the Youth Services Department with the science experiment. So stay tuned to our Facebook page so that you'll know when that is. So again, thank you so much for coming and visiting with us today. It's quite my privilege. All right. Bye, y'all.